Hi everyone and welcome to Bridging the Gap. I'm your host, Kelly LaBelle, and this week I'm joined by our expert guest, Natalie Panic. We're going to be talking about today leadership and advancing innovation. Natalie is part of the Mission System staff at MDA's Robotics and Automation Division. She works on Canadian space robotics and other space exploration programs. She's had internships at NASA's Space Flight Center, as well as NASA's Research Center. Natalie is on a mission to inspire the next generation of women to pursue careers in engineering and tech. She was named one of CBC's 12 Young Leaders Changing Canada, and Canada's Financial Post describes Natalie as a vocal advocate for women in technology. As a fellow woman in technology, I am really pleased to have you with us today, Natalie. Thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Could you perhaps start off by uh, sharing with our listeners a little bit of how you got started on on your leadership journey? Sure. So right now I work in mission systems at uh, MDA's Robotics and Automation Division, as you mentioned, uh, working on space robotics. And my path was kind of shaped by a lifelong dream to want to become an astronaut and travel to space. I actually grew up in Calgary in the Canadian Rockies spent a lot of time outdoors hiking and camping and I think that love of exploration here on earth coupled with a love of watching sci-fi on television created the perfect storm and recipe for pursuing aerospace engineering and landing my current job. In pursuing technology and engineering um, did you did you get started like from early on as um, as like a student and that was kind of your always your path or was this um, something that you found kind of later on in your career and getting into more of the space exploration part? Well, so I always had this long-term goal of wanting to work in the space industry and work on flying in space. But when I was in high school and younger than that, I don't think I really even knew what engineering was. I loved science and I loved math. So I took a lot of those subjects in high school. And then I had an amazing physics teacher who actually suggested engineering to me and showed me the rewards of a life built around science and engineering. So that's what encouraged me to pursue it in university. Do you have any advice for other young people out there who may be considering a career in in your in a similar path to you in terms of like looking back on your journey something that you wish you would have known back then I wish I would have known to get more involved in hands-on projects uh, extracurricular curricular activities like robotics programs or science fairs where I was actually doing research and experiments I think that's incredibly valuable when you transition from an academic environment into the workplace and I also wish I had have just reached out more to people and mentors like sent um, people that I found inspiring emails and tried to connect with them in person to make finding my own path a bit easier. Mentorship, I think, is an interesting topic because increasingly we hear it more and more as that that's kind of one of the key kind of attributes that uh, young entrepreneurs or leaders, I should say, um, should seek when we want to kind of get a jump start on our career or um, kind of explore different paths. But I find in technology, in particular things like science and engineering, it's not as easy to find mentors as it is like in a business world where you can just find like a CEO or executive in kind of your field because um, it's a much closer network because you're working in labs in different areas. Do you have any advice on how one could perhaps pursue um, finding a mentor in, in more your field? Well, I think definitely like if you're in school uh, doing undergraduate or graduate studies, you, the faculty or your teachers are great mentors and resources like they're not there just to teach you a course you can see them outside of of your course hours and and book office time with them and have those one-on-one -on -one conversations um, sometimes even if you see people in the news in in engineering or science you can track down their information online we have this great database on the internet of full of information that's easy to find people now so, so sometimes you have to do the legwork and the digging to find the contact info and then be willing to reach out. And the worst that someone can say is, no, they don't have the time. And the, the best is that they agree to have an email conversation with you or maybe you can even take them out for coffee or something. Now, looking at kind of your journey to date, um, and the you've had an incredible um, success in, in your journey, um, 
looking at it, is there any gaps that you find or challenges um, that you, like young women face in pursuing um, engineering or technology? I think it's a really multi-part problem. Like at a young age, we have to be inspiring young women to be interested in science and engineering and, and not to say they aren't naturally, but to encourage them that those options are available and that it's not as scary and, and challenging as people make it out to be. And then as you move into undergraduate and graduate studies and then into the workforce, we have to be figuring out how to put resources in place to overcome challenges so that women aren't grad just graduating with degrees and then moving on to something else after university or entering the workforce for five years and then moving on to something after that. We need to have um, plans in place so that we keep women involved in technology and the sciences all the way up to the director management and board level positions. In your, in your work right now, um, I guess, what is your, what is the best part <laughs> about a career in engineering um, or, or science? I think the best part is getting to be creative and problem solve. A lot of the time we work on really challenging problems that require teamwork and an understanding a bigger system and a bigger mission. As an example, right now I'm working on a Mars rover program and it's, it's difficult. We've never built a Mars rover before and every day is something new and you're learning from your peers. Um, and yeah, it's, it's just every single day. Well, I, I want to touch on that a little bit more because I, do you see parallels with some of the work you're doing or like what level of crossover do you see with the skills, let's say, of an entrepreneur versus an um, engineering in, in science? Because as you describe, like with new challenges every day, everything's different, problem solving, trying to innovate something that has not yet existed. In a lot of ways, that's what entrepreneurs do. We, do you find that there's similarities in terms of the, the skill sets that you may require? Yeah, definitely similarities. I think you, you summarized a lot of those already. And I think what's really interesting is when you get the merging of, of business and entrepreneurship and science and engineering, and then you get this platform of social innovation and maybe conservation technology. And it's really interesting to see how both of those realms combined can create something really positive in our world to affect positive change in our communities. Soft skills uh, is uh, increasingly um, a popular topic when we talk about things like this because we often, particularly like in a field like a, a science and engineering, we focus a lot about the hard skills. But entrepreneurship in a, a lot of sense is rooted in those soft skills, those transferable skills of the analytical thinking and the approach and um, a lot of the mindset. Is there, out of the kind of the skills you're applying right now, um, what would you say is kind of a key soft skill that you find yourself applying a lot in your in your work? Mm, that's a good question. You know, what I really want to say is probably communication. Uh, a lot of the time when you're working on an engineering project, it's a lot of different subsystems working on that that bigger problem and you have to be constantly communicating with the other teams and the other people involved to make sure that everybody understands how their part plays into the bigger system, into the bigger picture and to make sure that everyone is working towards your customer's needs because in the at the end of the day that's what you're building your product for. What's interesting, I was just having a conversation um, the other day and we were talking about business as people. And as much as we focus on like the physical products or technology and solutions, at the end of the day, those are a means to benefit people. And so at the root of everything is usually relationships. <laughs> right. Um, so looking at it, um, it's interesting to kind of look at that in terms of um, mm. an internal sense when you're innovating it during the process as well. Yeah, absolutely. Right now, um, in your what you're working on, you're working on some really exciting and interesting things. What do you see is like the the upcoming fields of, of focus and interest, or or trends that young uh, scientists and innovators uh, may want to look towards? Oh, it's a tough question to answer because there's so many possibilities. I mean. In my day-to-day -day work, one of the things I think is exciting and I've spoken often about is the idea of satellite servicing. 
So we have all these satellites orbiting around Earth, enabling many of the things that we rely on in our daily lives. But satellites, much like our vehicles or our appliances, have a finite life. And there's currently no laws in place that dictate what happens to a satellite at the end of its life. And so we have this growing problem of space debris. And I've had opportunities to work on projects trying to use robotics to repair and service satellites so that we're reusing them and recycling them instead of launching new ones to meet a growing demand. So that's kind of one area of the aerospace industry that's groundbreaking and innovative and a world first. Like nobody in the world has done robotic satellite servicing yet. It's it's actually a, um, an exciting field, and it's also an exciting field in the sense that um, well, I was just reading an article um, on, in CNN also about satellites, but on the different front is in the sense that in terms of security, because those satellites, if they're knocked out, um, like they can actually, in terms of war and different things, they can actually um, cut off a country from a lot of. Um, critical services and things that we're very dependent on. Like, can we imagine a world right now without Wi-Fi and some of the things that we use that we rely on these satellites for, from GPS to flying planes and all these different things? Do you see um, trends growing in those areas as well? Absolutely. I mean, the satellite industry is always going to have ties to politics and to to communication and to, to bring all these conveniences to the daily population. I mean, one of the other interesting things is companies like SpaceX are trying to launch these clusters of satellites to provide space-based internet. So you're launching like 4,000 satellites into orbit to provide people in developing countries with a service that they wouldn't otherwise have access to. And so it's really interesting to to kind of look at it from that perspective, but also the perspective of now we're launching 4,000 more satellites into orbit, which is more than are currently up there operationally. And how do we handle that in the future with this growing number that are orbiting around the Earth? Well, that's powerful in the sense that um, looking at kind of, we look at space as sometimes always looking outward in exploration, but actually using space to benefit us on, like those on Earth and developing countries. Uh, I, I haven't kind of, heard that perspective before and I think that that definitely opens a lot of opportunity and potential for startups and new innovations and in, um, a realm of um, exploration. Absolutely and I mean the, the idea of transferring the knowledge you gain from space exploration to terrestrial advances has been one of the main selling points of space exploration for decades. The fact that you can spin off these amazing advancements and positively benefit people here on earth is one of the great assets of, of thinking outwards and beyond Earth's orbit. In um, your experiences, um, I'm sure that you've had um, a variety of mentors and colleagues along the way. Is there um, one piece of advice that has stuck with you that someone else has provided you on your journey? I was often encouraged to work outside my comfort zone, not to be afraid to be vulnerable and to, to kind of look past that immediate fear of not being the expert or not knowing everything in that immediate moment. And I think it's really powerful learning opportunity to surround yourself with teams who can teach you things you don't know. And um, looking at um, individuals who want to maybe are not an engineer by trade, um, but are fascinated with space or um, uh, some of these topics that we're talking about right now and want to come at it from more of a, a business standpoint of they want to create a startup that leverages these technologies we're talking about to help terrestrial life. Um, do you have any advice for them on how they could uh, come into the ecosystem, so to speak, or get involved? I mean, I think there's definitely accelerator programs, which might be more space focused. There's things like the International Space Apps Challenge, which might be a great way to kind of see what's out there from a space technology perspective. And I think even if you search NASA's websites, they have ways that they're trying to merge entrepreneurship with the science and technology aspects of things. The more I talk to you, the more I realize that it, it's 
increasingly um, entrepreneurship is kind of getting melded into almost every field we pursue. We used to kind of see it as this, this, this silo of like biz, uh, an offshoot of business, but it almost innately is becoming more of a, a skill set that you, or a mindset, so to speak, that you can apply to, to any field to advance innovation. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so I joined Twitter maybe three or four years ago and I, it, kind of was overwhelming just how many entrepreneurs were out there working on so many really great projects. And that was the first time I realized that you could have this really powerful pairing of the entrepreneurial and STEM, so that science, technology, engineering, and math sectors, and how those two worlds could unite to, to really create positive change and, and build resilient communities. And then do you have any last final thoughts um, that you would like to leave our listeners with? One of the things I always say is just to dream big and to dare to achieve the impossible. A lot of times as we grow older, our ideas and our imaginations kind of get stifled by maybe cynicism. And I think we need to remind ourselves and encourage the young people in our lives just to go for it, to, to follow your dreams. And that if you get the right team together, is in place anything is achievable well, i want to thank you natalie for joining me on bridging the gap and sharing some of your insights for those who are listening it's your turn what do you think add your thoughts to the discussion using the hashtag bridging the gap on twitter and give this podcast a thumbs up if you like some of the advice and tips that we have talked about today Natalie, I think some of the work you're doing is is quite fascinating, uh, and I'm really excited to see some of the advancements that you're working on, uh, and also learn a little bit more from our listeners in terms of some of the ideas that um, our our young leaders may have in applying that entrepreneurial mindset to these science and engineering topics. So thank you for your time. Thank you so much for having me.